talk about accomplished. She is a renowned researcher, a physician, the chief executive of one of the world's most well-known hospitals, as well as a director at one of the world's oldest and largest pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Lori Glimsher, thanks for joining us here at the Bio Bus Center. My pleasure. So this year's Bio is once again very close on the heels of ASCO, which as you know is the world's biggest cancer research and development data meeting. So given that that's your area of specialty at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, what is your take on the state of the state in cancer right now? We are in a remarkable time for cancer. As I think I've said many times before, we've experienced two revolutions in cancer in the last 15 years. The first one being the advent of targeted or precision medicine, which allows us to attack specific genetic mutations in patients' tumors. And I would say in precision medicine, we are at the third generation. First generation was identifying all the mutations, the second was developing some drugs to those mutations, and now we've got to figure out how to circumvent resistance to those mutations. Because many patients respond dramatically to targeted therapeutics, but eventually the tumor is a little bit smarter and tends to circumvent. So that's the next generation. And we saw some of that at ASCO. The second revolution is something that's near and dear to my heart, which is immunotherapy, activating your own immune system. And that became absolutely spectacular progress uh, several years ago with the advent of the checkpoint blockers, mm -hmm. one against CTLA-4, Yervoy, and the second against uh, the PD-1 or PDL one receptor, inhibitory receptor. These are drivers of cancer. And these are, what happens is that the immune system does not become activated enough, it gets exhausted, and it doesn't attack the tumor even though it should. So again, I think we're at the tip of the iceberg because these new immunotherapeutics, and that includes as well CAR T cells, are fantastic, but they only treat 20% of patients. So only some tumors are responsive to immunotherapeutics, and within those tumors, only a minority of patients are. So we have a long ways to go, and I think we're seeing some progress there. Uh, uh, which was uh, highlighted at ASCO. So clearly a lot more work still to be done. So that's the data side of the equation, but another big part of the conversation still today is pricing. Doctor, what's your point of view on that? You know, our healthcare budget in the United States is far higher per GDP than any other developed country. And yet, the quality of our health care is not does not necessarily rank in the top six it ranks in the top 16 but towards the bottom about 17 percent of health care costs are from drugs now there is a distinction between a me too drug and a truly transformative drug and i use hepatitis c as an example this was a drug that absolutely cured patients with a deadly disease that resulted in many hospitalizations and huge healthcare costs. To me, that drug was worth $80,000 because it's a cure. Mm -hmm. That is truly transformative. I put some of the immunotherapy drugs in that category as well. There are patients alive today who had end-stage metastatic skin cancer melanoma who were on death's door who are still alive today because of those immunotherapy drugs. That being said, we need to be very sensitive to drug prices. We need to make drugs affordable to everybody. Uh, this is diversity and inclusion, and we cannot afford to only take care of people who have the resources to afford these drugs. I would say the conversation in Washington now about um, curtailing drug prices is confusing. I don't know where it's going to end up. It certainly has gotten a lot of attention. I think it's a lot of smoke and not a lot of clarity yet. One obvious uh, target is getting generic drugs on the market earlier. Mm -hmm. To pick up on the thread you just mentioned regarding diversity, another major topic of discussion. You're one of five women, remarkably, on the board of GlaxoSmithKline. What do you think still needs to be done regarding not just gender diversity, but all types of diversity within the life sciences? We are far from where we want to be. I don't think there is an institution, a company, that can say we are truly diverse and inclusive. At Dana-Farber, we're putting in place a number of different programs 
unconscious bias training and really taking this on seriously because you know if we don't take advantage of the 50% of talent for example that is women then we're losing out we're all losing out um, I'm very proud to be on the board of GSK and that's in part that's because we do have five female board members it's probably 40% of the board and of course we have a fantastic CEO Emma Walmsley who is the first female CEO of any a large pharmaceutical company and uh, she is doing uh, a marvelous job in how to reshape Jack GlaxoSmithKline to make it the very best company it can be. So work left to be done on diversity, discovery, development and delivery. Dr. Lori Glimsher from Thank the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thanks for joining us here at the BioBus Thank Center. You.